Welcome to the Paywall Podcast, where we discuss paywalls and paywall strategies for news and magazine publishers. This episode of the Paywall Podcast is brought to you by Leaky Paywall. Leaky Paywall is the most flexible WordPress subscription platform. Find out more at leakypaywall.com. And now for today's episode. Welcome to the Paywall Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest, Bet Hannon from Accessi Cart. She is the CEO and founder uh, of this group that deals with managed website accessibility. So this is uh, something that I know a little bit about, but not really a lot about. Bet knows about it quite a bit. She's in deep uh, since 2008, I think, if that's correct. Yeah. And we're going to talk about the, this trend that's coming. Uh, I think it's I think it's got financial motivation and it's got legal motivation uh, to uh, make sure that your website's website is accessible to those who have handicaps. So welcome, Beth. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate Great. it. Yeah, good to be here. Awesome, awesome. All right, so let's. I want to lead with the pain point, I oh, just because okay. I think it's important. So. If you could help our publisher listeners talk about what is accessibility, because I think it's really important to define what it is, and then more importantly, or as importantly, why is it important? Yeah. Web accessibility is really about making sure that all your users, whether they have disabilities or not, can use your website. It's real, And um, around the world, web accessibility gets framed in terms of human rights and uh, legislation in terms of that. So it's really about creating equal access. It includes things. When I go to um, places, a, a lot of times people are uh, surprised because maybe they've never really thought about how people who are blind or who have mobility impairments might use the website or need help to use the website. Mm. Uh, for instance, people who are blind, totally blind, would use a screen reader. Um, it reads out loud sections of the page to them. People who can't use a mouse, because maybe they're paralyzed or, or they have mobility impairments, they use adaptive devices that come back to keyboard navigation through your website. So they're essentially using a device. Stephen Hawking had a little sensor on his cheek. Yeah. Right? And they're just pre basically pressing the tab and enter keys with a device. And... We include all kinds of disabilities. There are reading disabilities. There are all kinds of ways that we can help various people be able to get access to your site. And it's kind of like, it's like you wouldn't build a brick and mortar store and then like create walls and barriers for people to get mm -hmm. in. You want to make it as easy as possible for everybody to come in and be a customer. So in terms of Legal pieces, most places in the world, most developed nations have laws about web accessibility or digital accessibility. Uh, most of the rest of the world besides the United States uses some kind of complaint and fine system. So someone hmm. can file a complaint and then there's a fine that gets levied against you. In the United States, <laughs> we use the litigious sponge, right? So our stuff... We don't have some of the same clarity about the requirements. And so that's devolved into some lawsuits under the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA. Mm -hmm. And because things are not super clear, these cases just keep getting piling up. They're increasingly showing us that, yes, websites do fall under ADA. But what's happened is then you'll get a pre these predatory lawsuits. So you'll get one uh, disabled plaintiff, typically a blind person, and their attorney suing dozens and dozens of websites at the same time or mm -hmm. near, uh, over time. Lots and lots. Uh, there are very few uh, firms that make a, a, a significant chunk of all of the suits, right? And so we talk about these as predatory, but they re are real lawsuits. And so you have to... Mm -hmm step it up and typically they're settled. We saw just over 4,000 of these suits last year in U.S. Fed federal courts. We estimate that somewhere between two and, time, two and three times as many are settled before they get to court. 
Mm. And so when you mention the financial incentive, right, there's a huge financial incentive there not to do that because a single case or a settlement even could be, well, they can be fairly low in terms of somewhere around $10,000 by the time you're dealing with all of your attorney's fees and the fines and, uh, and the settlement. They can go as high as 30, 40, 50, even more. Domino's Pizza had to pay a million. Okay. Yeah, it can be a pretty expensive proposition. And so the thing that you want to do is, first of all, become aware, start learning. It's not a, it's a journey that's not, there's no easy, quick solution, mm -hmm. but to start learning what you need to do and start working at making your site more effective, accessible. Over time. So let me unpack this a little bit. So there yeah. are, there are essentially some law firms that are going after specific organizations. Are they e-commerce or they, do they fit a category? How do, um, somewhat, does that work? I, I would say the broad category is sites with a lot of user interaction, right? So about 83% of the cases last year were e-commerce sites, right? So if you think okay. about it, that's a lot of user interaction. People are searching and filtering for things. People are putting things in carts and then checking out. Um, hospitality is another big piece, but media is also up there, right? And so uh, especially when you're talking about um, it's not just searching around, you need to make sure that people can use the site in terms of things like searching. But then if you've got stuff like paywall going, you want to make sure that they're going to be able to check out, right? If you if people can't actually complete a checkout on your site, you're losing money. Yeah. And good, figuring good out how to do those things. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good segue into the other side. So there's the legal financial side. Mm -hmm. There's the legal you should do this because it's a good thing to do, equal access, as you mentioned. But then the financial side of lost opportunity. Absolutely. Let's say we shelve the legal argument altogether. What are, in our case, we have publishers that do have an e-commerce set up because they're charging access to their content. Mm -hmm. So what are they missing? Let's say I'm a publisher and I have, and I'm ignoring those with accessibility issues. What, what, am, I, what am I missing out on revenue-wise? There's no way to quantify, but you can begin to talk about some of the benefits that accessibility brings. It, you almost always improve the search engine optimization of your site when you improve accessibility. So like, accessibility includes some things like making sure your images have alternative text on them and making mm -hmm. sure your heading structure is proper. All of those things that Google is our, and the search engines are looking for, right? So you're improving search engine optimization. When you start to make something better for people with disabilities, the great side effect is that you make the user experience better for everybody. Mm. We sometimes call this the curb cut effect, right? Mm. So curb cuts are in the sidewalk to help people with wheelchairs and scooters, but people who are pushing strollers or dragging briefcases or luggage or all of that, like it benefits all of us. And mm. so that spills over and you get a much better user experience because if you think about a lot of people may have a situational impairment, right? I'm trying to use your site while I've got a wiggly baby on my hip mm. and on my phone and bright sunlight. Those people will have better user experiences if your site is accessible. So SEO, a user experience improvement, it's a great investment in your current customers. So we know that disabilities increase as people age, even things like people, your eyesight starts to change. You and I are 50-ish, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we're, mm -hmm. uh, that eyesight mm -hmm. is starting to change. Yep. Color perception is starting to change. That's a little harder to see. But, but all of those pieces, if your demographic is people over 50, it's, you really ought to be doing this as an investment in your customers. And then it's a, it's a great investment in your brand too, right? There's a lot of folks that are values-driven buyers and that value of being inclusive and welcoming, right? Whether into whatever niche it is, right? You want to welcome everyone and people like, it's a feel good. It's great. It's a great brand building kind of piece. I would say if you're going to make your site accessible and you want that, some of that benefit, you need to make sure that you're putting an accessibility statement on the bottom of your, just down there by the privacy policy on your site, mm. just to talk about 
we, we're trying to make this a, a, a welcoming uh, place for everybody. So what, I, what I'm hearing is you get benefits on the front end as far as SEO usability in general. I like the situational us usability because I think a lot of people don't really think about, yeah, you, I might not have an accessibility need, but if the site is simpler and friendlier and yes, I'm multitasking or whatever, and it, it, or I'm on the beach, which I, by the way, I hate reading on the beach. <laughs> I can't do it. But if a site were actually readable on the beach is an extreme example, yeah. that's a plus, right? Oh, I yeah. Absolutely. So, I think, um, yeah, I think sometimes we think users are really just like in a distraction free, lighted, right, full right. screen monitor, right. that thing. And that's just really not the case. So all and the time. I'll, on the back end, if you keep your, if you're keeping, like in our case, your subscribers, if you're keeping them happy, mm -hmm. that's churn reduction. So any, oh, anything you can do to keep a customer happy either brings them back or, or yeah. keeps them subscribing in, in, in our case. Yeah, now, yeah. what is there, a, what's the data on like percentage of folks across the world or US or whatever that, that have accessibility needs? and is there any data on like a before and after where a website might go and lean into accessibility in the e-commerce space? And then there was like maybe a, a percentage boost to their revenues. Is that, that's, maybe that's data that's, that we're going to see down the road, but have uh, you run some, it, run some it to pieces that? of that. So let's unpack that a little bit. In the United States, the CDC says that about 25% of all U.S. adults have some disability that requires mm -hmm. accommodation. So I think a lot of times when people are thinking about people with disabilities in their heads, it's a very small number because they are uh, they 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 think about the people that they know, and it feels like a small number. What you need to remember is that lots of disabilities are more invisible, right? Mm -hmm. So someone who has a seizure disorder, for example, or has a vision, uh, has issues when they have migraine headaches, they can't perceive, it changes color perception stuff. Mm. And so uh, some of those things are just not visible to us all the time. Mm. So about 25% of people have some uh, disability that requires an accommodation in the United States. Uh, that number is actually pretty well substantiated across the world in most developed nations. 20 to 25% is the, the kind of number that keeps coming up again and again. Now, in terms of benefits or loss, there's a, a great study from, oh my gosh, I guess it's maybe seven years ago now, 2018. In the UK, a study of websites that were, how much they were losing 6.9 billion pounds per year to their more accessible customers. Uh, competitors. Wow. Right? So competitors that made their sites accessible were gaining customers. The inaccessible sites were losing, and the estimate was that it was 6.9 billion pounds per year. Jiminy. Okay. That's a lot. That's um, a lot. Yeah. yeah. That's... Yeah. And there are some that, some studies that are, they're trying to do more of this quantification because people like the, the data. And we know that for some people, that's really just what's going to motivate them to, right. to get moving. But right. they're coming more and more out of Europe. And there are more kinds of, sh m more concern about accessibility in many ways in Europe. So. Interesting. Yeah. So there's, I, there are a lot, it sounds like there's a lot of factors on the front end, on the back end to motivate really paying attention to accessibility. Of course, where humans are, are motivated by Something you must do now to not die, but, <laughs> but that's how yeah. we're wired. We're survive. F f don't do it flight. until I have to do it. That's right. 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 That's right. So and that's hard. And, and it is. And the other factor with accessibility is while there are lots of things in terms of making your site more accessible, some small things that you can do yourself that are not super big, depending on your technical debt, in other words, how you've put your site together, mm -hmm. maybe, right? Yeah. There may be cost to doing that. Um, and certainly there's some cost for uh, making sure that you're you know, doing some testing or 
all of those pieces, uh, all of those parts of accessibility. And so it's easier not to spend the money when it's not that immediate, right. like, I must right. do this. Right. And so beginning to think about that. And the thing to know is that if you get sued, there's a new, we can talk in a little bit about the European, the new European law that are, is coming. In. If you're going to have to meet new legal standards, it's tempting to put it off, but it's going to be more cost effective to start and work at this over time mm. rather than try to pile it on. Accessibility is not ever a sort of one and done project. It really needs to become something that you're putting into play every time you're putting up a new post. Gotcha. Okay. So let's segue into what our publisher audience can do. And I'd like mm -hmm. to do that through a story. I think you earlier, you provided me with an example. I'm just going to share my screen here for anybody who's anybody who's watching via YouTube. Well, I think this is your site, right? Yeah. Sessicart.com. And the the website we're looking at today is megayachtnews.com. So this was, this, tell me the story. What, how did these guys start? How did you run into them? And where are they now? Yeah, so Mega Yacht News came to us for some help. Prim uh, initially, mostly with, with management of the website. And they came to us a number of years ago before they really became, took off in terms of their readership. As we were talking in the pre-roll, they, the, the show Below Decks, which is a reality-based show on some of the mega yachts uh, and their staff, it really led this publication to really to take off in terms of their readership. Mm, mm, below Decks. Um, but they right. came to us and we look at how are so we primarily worked with them with hosting and maintenance of the site pieces and then when we did a redesign we came back so there are a couple things here one is see how there is a the 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 black opacity box for mm -hmm. making sure that there is enough color contrast there mm, so that right. anybody can read that no matter what the hero image is behind it. So there's some things like that that, that can make that site a little more. Gotcha. Accessible. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how, like, in this case, is this part of, is this part of the, that uh, is, what no, is that? that's a uh, part of her privacy policy. Uh, I see that. Okay. Gotcha. All right. If I were a publisher and uh, now I'm going to share a, a true story. One of our customers a few years ago came to us and said, Hey, I want to make sure that our, our website is accessible. And this was back in the day when we were doing website uh, development and we knew a bit about it, but we took them through a process where we installed some, some plugins and we did some uh, scans and we got them to, I don't remember all the details, but some sort of accessibility point. And the challenge, and I know you work, you work in WordPress pretty deeply. The challenge is that the themes control a lot of what's happening with accessibility, with the interface, it's all this really the output of the design, all the design language. So you have to, it's almost like come on one, you probably look at each individual site uniquely. It's okay. What's actually happening here? What's the theme yep. doing? What it, we talked about forms earlier, like all these things. What, what are some starting points for publishers? Yeah. What can I, and everything I look at as a challenge is like, what's the low hanging fruit? What can you get to right away? And then what's the end goal here? And where are we going to work to? And I think the whys are, we talked about the whys. Hey, you got somebody who's sniffing around your industry and the publisher client was in the, in the fishing, sports fishing niche. And they were, the attorneys were coming after his friends like his colleagues that were, so he was genuinely worried about it. And Absolutely. I don't think 
I'm not sure what actually happened, but he, we, we got him to a, a comfortable uh, place, but we haven't, again, this is not our wheelhouse, so we haven't looked at it in yeah. years, right? Yeah. So in WordPress there, as you alluded to, there are things that are controlled by the theme. So for example, when you looked at that homepage, that op black, gray, opac yeah. box with opacity, that's definitely controlled by the theme. But, and there are also then things that are much more content related. So I would say the easiest thing to do if you're a publisher um, is start working on the, the, the content related things so that right. you stop creating new inaccessible content. Yeah. So, right. so it's like getting your content people, whoever's putting this in, getting them trained about how to do this. So there mm. are uh, the number one thing, or, or there would be three things that are the big, huge things for content. And that would be making sure every image has alt text, not mm. just has alt text, but all the what alt text is different than a caption. You might also have a caption, but the alt text is what describes the image and its function in this mm. particular context to a visually impaired user. Make sure that you've got alt text, but good alt text on all those images. You want to make sure that your heading structure is, people use H, H1 is the page title. There should only ever be one H1 on a page or mm -hmm. a post. And then H2, and then you're going to properly nest them. You never skip from a two to a four or a two to a five. So you're making sure you're nesting those, those H tags. And then uh, using any color contrast. So if you're putting in a button or uh, anything like that, just making sure those color choices are uh, have good color contrast. Those three issues, it's estimated, that when you look at all the... Uh, web accessibility issue uh, use all across the web. Those three issues account for 80% of all issues wow. across the web. So if you're starting to deal with those three issues, you can, that's a great start on low hanging fruit. And notice those are not developer requirements. Mm. Those are really basic content knowledge putting things into a post. So get your content, yourself or your content people trained and start putting things in a much, in, in a more accessible way. Now, if you want to step up from that, I would say you want to take a look at the plugin called Accessibility Checker okay. from Equalize, from my friends at Equalize Digital. And it's a plugin that will go into the WordPress website and on every page and post and product in WooCommerce, if you buy the pro version, you can get basically a check of all of some accessibility things. Now you need to, your people, it's not always intuitive about how to do that. And so you'll want to get them some training about how to make the maximal use of that plugin, mm -hmm. but that's a great plugin. It's a, the free version is available in the WordPress repository. In the free version, you have to open each page or post. And I would say if you're, Put it in, get your people trained in terms of how to use it for creating new stuff. The pro version of the plugin lets you run sort of site-wide scans and you get a nice dashboard of mm -hmm. what you can put out. You can look at all your past stuff too, but just put the free version in and get started learning how to put new content in. And then, you know, um, you want to also then start looking at... Uh, as we work a lot with e-commerce and other high interaction sites, it's often that, as we were talking before, it's that checkout process that really is the place where there are often problems. And so mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you're getting someone to help you check the key, the process for paying on your site. Right? Right. You, want to, you, want, you don't want to be preventing somebody from doing that. Right. And so, like having someone help you and a particular keyboard navigation. Mm -hmm. I, you can start to do that yourself. Just go to a page or a post and just start pressing tab and enter and see how far you can get in that process. That's great. So let me just, let me wrap that up a little bit. Um, but I love that, I, I love that you leaned into tackling the, the thing that's creating the, the most uh, content on your website. So in the publisher space, that would be publishing a new article, uh, yeah. typically. We, you, I talked to a publisher 
last week who publishes 600 articles a day. Now it's, yeah, it's crime news and they're reposting for, for a whole state, but it, it's huge traffic and it's monetizable, believe it or not. And so there, there's probably a, a challenge there, but going after the, the stuff that's essentially mushrooming on your website, I think that is great. And uh, it's what the uh, publishers are, are best at. So that's a good place to start. Header structure. Yeah. I think a lot of people mess that up, including myself. Color contrast. That probably starts to get a little more gray for the publishers or maybe not so technical or really anybody. And then the plugin, you call it accessibility checker plugin. That mm -hmm. sounds, those all sound like low hanging fruit to go after for sure. The checkout process. Yeah. That's where the money is. <laughs> so that's, I think we're going to find publishers I mean, there, checking that people, first. That may be where they want to start. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Is everything working as intended? And really, if, if you're really pretty locked down behind the paywall, then people aren't going to get to your articles until they clear that hurdle. And that's right. so that may be the place actually to start for some folks. Yeah. I, and I so, said that in jest, but it's actually true, right? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great place to start. The checkout, when we're helping publishers launch their paywalls, it's all about that, that f those final steps, that final interaction in it. Yeah. Might be a good thing to, maybe we can chat offline about maybe helping publishers get over that accessibility step too. That might be something yeah, to chat about. Absolutely. So what happens next? So let's let, what's the 20% where, and who's taking the 20% route? You know what I mean? Like you have the low hanging fruit, these three areas, all text, header structure, color contrast that handles about 80% of it. What about the 20%? What's well, the, okay. So what's that? when we say that it's important to distinguish that 80% across the entire web, not yeah. in any one website. And yeah. th that may be true on the site where there are 600 posts. They have the 80% the of their 600 posts a day is, yeah. are those three issues. I would say on a smaller site, that's really not, those percentages are going to be a little different. So it's just the context is important there. But, but other things that uh, folks uh, may want to look at in terms of, um, oh, one thing that's, classic for, for kind of old school publishing is full justification and you would never accessibility standards say you don't want to do full justification it creates for people with a reading disabilities what are called rivers of white in other words they see the white the continuity of the white spaces rather mm -hmm. than the words mm -hmm. and so avoiding full justification there there's we're starting, we start to get into a lot of small things. You can get to the point where you're looking at things like you may want to, there, <laughs> this is the thing that I think makes people frustrated about accessibility, but also it makes it complex and difficult is that sometimes things that are, um, make things more accessible for one group of people may impact another group of people. So there are some mm -hmm. people, for instance, some of those people over 50, like we were talking about, who find it easier to read on lighter colored backgrounds. Mm -hmm. They're reading dark print on lighter colored backgrounds. But there are other people with different kinds of uh, disabilities, uh, both uh, reading, but also just, they're just different. They prefer darker cut that, that hurts their eyes. The lighter colors, more eye fatiguing. Mm. They need dark colored background. Interesting. And so providing some options or you'll see some places, the browser gives the user a chance. To, uh, there's a setting that can be made that says, if there is a dark option, dark theme option, show me that. And so that may be something at some point that people may want to get into that. Yeah. That, that's not a, those things are not necessarily requirements, but they, you can see now no site is ever a hundred percent accessible, right? right? Because you've got 
that piece where even people's competing needs may make it real difficult. You don't have to try and do all things to all people, but I think you can begin to offer some options for folks. So that may be a thing you want to create a dark theme option. And there's sometimes there's a little toggle that people can use. But even things like we, we start to look at eventually there, and there's like a, you want to look at that low hanging fruit, like you've talked about, but then how can we begin to think about different user personas, different people, different users with different types of disabilities and how they might experience some of these things. And we get to where we look at things like, is your checkout process so complicated that people with anxiety and depression Mm -hmm. give up? Mm -hmm. They just never make it through because it's just complicated or it's not clear Mm -hmm. or you're not giving them enough confidence to keep going because they don't know where they are in the process. So things like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Uh, I, and to your point earlier, like I was thinking if I had a, I like black background and white text. Like that's just my preferred reading experience. Sometimes white backgrounds are a little bright for me and it's, like, oh, and when I find that switch, it's, ah, oh, this is great. So I, I'm just the opposite. I like the, yeah. I like the white backgrounds and yeah. it, I find it less fatiguing. So, you know, it's, it, it's all about rec- recognizing it's in some ways, it's all about recognizing that whether it's whether we want to label these things disabilities or not, there are a lot of user preferences that your yeah. users are not mono. Their preferences are not unified in that way. And how can right. we create enough options or enough ways that people can engage with our content that, right. Um, right. that make it easier for them? That sounds like a question for you to answer for somebody who's really? looking I at I love helping to solve these problems. <laughs> hey, so I got one last question for you before we Only wrap one? this up. I, wh- where, do, where are the trends going? Uh, do, you, do you have any future like predictions in terms of where accessibility is going based on e- economics, making things better for readers and legality? And then I'm going to throw AI <laughs> into the mix yep. too because- yep. Everyone's talking about AI like crazy for everything. Yep. One of the things that's coming that we haven't talked about yet is that in June of 2025, there's are is new EU uh, legislation that will cover most websites. Um, there's there are exceptions if you're under two million euro in revenue or mm. under ten employees. But pretty much, it's going to be pretty wide ranging to require sites to be accessible if you have EU customers. Mm -hmm. So I think there are going to be increasing pushes like that. We we do see some of the increasing enforcement around some other countries that are some of those laws around accessibility were written. In such a way, they recognize that it takes a while to get your site accessible. So they they create these laws. They give them a long kind of lead time, long warning time before they start enforcing. And the the exceptions for smaller businesses were very high. And then over time, some of those laws were written that they're ratcheting down. Mm. Eventually, everybody's going to have to comply. And so even though you may be exempted now, you really should be thinking long term that that's going to apply to you at some point in the future. Right. And in the U.S., that could apply to you as soon as the next lawsuit, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's kind of, <laughs> right? It's uh, you don't right. really get much warning, and so I would say I think people come at this and they get worried. Mm. And you talked about your cl- mm. your client that was worried. And yeah. the thing about worry is that you want to begin to think about how you can start addressing some things so that you're not just letting it continue to balloon and go. Mm-hmm. One of the things that the that's changing a little is that the in the U.S., the Department of Justice is the one that sort of watches these ADA lawsuits. They acknowledged finally last year that 
it's really difficult to measure compliance, mm. right? We've talked about like the things that might make it better for one person might make it worse for another. And so it's, mm. kind of, oh, it's really hard to measure compliance. Mm. And so there they said, going forward, at least in part, how we will measure compliance is that we will, do you have a regular program of testing remediation and remediation? Uh -huh. Do you have a reg? Are you working at this as opposed to are you perfect? Because nobody's ever perfect. Right. And that's a piece of how we've begun to think a little bit differently about how to do accessibility. So traditionally, agencies like ours helped customers like your customers. Yeah. By pr producing an audit. A snapshot in time with here's a list of the problems on the site. And the problem is you, sites like your customers are changing all the time, right? Right, so right. It's really hard. And then we would watch these customers get overwhelmed and they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they would follow through on one or two things. And then it just sat there like mm -hmm. it was all done or they weren't sure what to do next. And so that's a piece of how we've tried to make a little bit of a pivot to say, look, we can help you in an ongoing way we can help you like a turnkey program to do that testing and remediation and reporting. And we, we can provide some resources for folks doing that. And I think that, that I hope that lowers that anxiety about right. it because you know you're working at it. Right. And what I like, and so you got that covered for clients. What I like is that you're tackling accessibility as yeah, sites need to be accessible, but you're also tackling as, yeah, this is generally good for your UI and your business in oh, general. So you can get the benefits of, yeah, you can you know, leave your worry and we're going to help you make things just better for your regular visitors. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm going to put your information where, so let's say somebody is looking for guidance. What should they do? How do they get in touch with you? Oh, you could just um, hit that contact form up there. Happy to okay. take emails from the contact form. That's probably the best, best piece for us. And then, but happy to chat with folks. And yeah. All right. Yeah. That sounds great. But thanks for uh, sharing so much wisdom. Oh, really appreciate you're it. You're welcome. Good luck. Yeah. All yeah. right. Thank you. Yeah. We'll, right. catch, we'll catch you next time. All right. Thanks, Pete. Yep. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to the Paywall Podcast. If you'd like to get in touch to discuss subscription strategy, go to leakypaywall.com. See you next time.